Hey, this is John. Let's Talk Native is now on Patreon. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash let's talk native. We will be producing exclusive content for our Patreon supporters. Thanks for checking us out. Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cataraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. We highlight the voices of Native activists, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, and musicians who are fighting for the rights of indigenous people all over Turtle Island. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. In this moment of historical change and social justice, Our voices matter now more than ever before. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Sego, and thanks for listening. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Hey, I want to, right off the bat, uh, mention that we are a podcast, and you can find our podcast by searching us on Google or Alexa or your smart speaker. Um, We are on all the major podcast platforms. We are also on YouTube. We actually crossed the uh, the 1,000 subscriber list uh, just, I think, yesterday or today. Uh, So look for us on YouTube, which is Let's Talk Native TV. That's our YouTube channel. And we are also on on Patreon, so check us out there as well. Um, I got to ask a question, and, and I've raised this before, you know, actually it's been years ago, but you, you got, I got to wonder, why, why do we still need to fight for our autonomy? Why, why is it such a difficult battle? What is it that the United States and Canada, for that matter, why do they perceive our distinction as such a threat? I mean, that's the question. I mean, and... And I ask that because if you look at things historically, I, I, let, me, let me read a quote here from, from Jack Weatherford's book, uh, Indian Givers. The most consistent theme in the descriptions penned about the New World was the amazement at the Indians' personal liberty, in particular their freedom from rulers and from social classes based on ownership of property. For the first time, the French and the British became aware of the possibility of living in social harmony and prosperity without the rule of a king. Again, that's Jack Weatherford from his book, Indian Givers. You know, there was an amazement with that. And, and it wasn't, it was a bit of a culture shock, I guess, for them. Because they couldn't imagine that, that people could live without this hierarchy of power uh, that would keep people in line. This idea of actually being responsible to and for each other was something that was, was, was so un, unusual. But... Our influence changed how what ultimately would be the colonists would would, uh, would hold themselves and even the, the, the declaring their own independence. Yet, what they viewed in us as something they could take for their own uh, phil- uh, you know, philosophy in terms of uh, fighting for independence is still something that they regarded as a threat. And, and, I, got, and I asked that question. I can't help um, but wonder at some point... Um, at, at some point, do we even, why is it such a threat? I mean, and that's, that's obviously the biggest question. And because and I, I, there's been study after study after study that has discussed our, the economic impacts of, um, of native territories and the fact that we build economies somewhat based on our sovereignty and our distinction. So whether we're talking about gaming or whether we're talking about uh, sale or manufacturing of a product that uh, utilizes our regulatory advantages to give uh, to give an otherwise disadvantaged community a, a bit of an advantage to do to do something. But the states and the regions have always benefited from this kind of thing. So it's amazing to me 
that even when you look at the economic benefit that we provide, uh, native territories provide states and regions, sometimes if we're close to a, a city uh, like here in Seneca Territory, not far from Buffalo, the direct benefit is really, really obvious. So it, it, it goes back to begging that question then. So why do governors, it doesn't matter if it's Democrats or Republicans, why are we in a constant pitched battle with, with states and the federal government in fighting for our autonomy, the things that we uh, the, the things that we fight for environmental issues usually are like years ahead of the rest of society catching on to uh, to their concern about environment, global warming, if you will. Many of the things that that we have done as a part of our cultural practices years later get revisited. And one of the things that comes to mind is the uh, is the controlled burn issue. All of a sudden, native people are all over the news because. California and Oregon and Washington are on fire because of the poor um, management of, and I don't mean just raking like Donald Trump suggests, but but the poor management. The, the, the thing about a fire is if you suppress the fire so quickly that you still leave a lot of material that's left to burn, and if you don't control the burn, and this is something that was back, basically practiced throughout the entire continent. You know, when, when um, uh, the... the uh, discoverer, or no, one of, one of, explorer, what do I call them? The Europeans, I guess, showed up on the East Coast. They were amazed that there could be a canopy of trees that was so passable that they could, they could literally ride their horses under a canopy of trees for miles. They were amazed at that. And that was, didn't happen by accident. And, and of course, once Europeans gained control of certain territories, uh, and and push native people out or try to control native behavior, they would immediately um, put an end to some of these uh, these practices that we had been that we had adopted and developed for for centuries, and and now people are paying the price for it. So and when I ask this question, why are we always in this battle with the, with the states? And and I ask the secondary question, which is why do they perceive us as such a threat? There's no good answers. And, and again, you can talk to politicians, you can talk to uh, environmentalists, you can talk to uh, you know, any uh, economists, and over and over and over again, you will see that what we have established in our territories, and oftentimes our, our economies are pretty challenged all by themselves, but when we do develop an economy, some of those things that we develop end up being the model that, that the states follow. I mean, for instance, I mean, when states create their, their empowerment zones and their tax-free zones and that kind of stuff, they do that all the while they're actually fighting us for, 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 for not paying their taxes. I mean, there was an, a real irony that while we were in this pitched battle with, uh, with Andrew Cuomo, uh, the governor of the state of New York, over the, the, taxing, the taxation of tobacco products, he was trying to open up the rest areas on the New York State Thruway to sell tax-free booze. I mean, somehow the idea of selling uh, tax-free booze uh, at a rest stop on a, on, on a highway doesn't sound like a great idea to me. But, uh, but again, the, the, the hypocrisy of that was completely missed. I, I had suggested that, uh, to a cartoonist they should actually show the difference between uh, the the state and the federal government with their ATF and their state agents raiding a, a smoke shop for selling tax-free cigarettes at the same time doing some glorious ribbon cutting for a, for tax-free booze sales, uh, in, you know, at one of the New York state through rest areas. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about gaming. I mean, look, native people for the mo outside of Atlantic city and, uh, and Nevada, native people created the gaming market. Uh, whether it was for Connecticut with Foxwood and Mohican Sun, or whether it's here in New York with the, the Senecas and the, uh, uh, the Oneidas and, and the Mohawks. States like New York didn't even have gaming. It was illegal. They found ways to manipulate their law so they could do a, a, a class of gaming that looked like slot machines, that looked like you know, uh, um, uh, class three gaming, but they said would skirt the regulations. And then ultimately... After years of native gaming had conditioned the electorate or the, or, or, uh, of New York, they managed to put it on their ballot uh, for a constitutional amendment 
and ultimately changed the law. Laws that had been in place to, to stop organized crime and all kinds of other things for, you know, for decades, you know, almost half a century. So we not only created the, the, the gaming market for, for states like New York and others, but, they, but we also loosened up their electorate so they could approve gaming in states that didn't have, uh, that had uh, gaming prohibitions. And not to mention the fact that we are under a constant uh, state of extortion by states like New York State to grab, to grab money from native gaming, something that w should be prohibited by law. In fact, according to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, it is prohibited for the states to impose these kinds of fees. But they find their way around it, and they find other ways to uh, to extort revenue sharing. They call it. It's not. They don't call it taxation. They call it revenue sharing. They find ways to extort that out of out of native people with this kind of outside loaded threat. Well, if you don't do revenue sharing, we have no reason to enter into a a, a gaming compact with you. And according to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, you need one now. I don't think anybody's really uh, really tested that adequately, but this is again it, it, it's almost mind boggling when you think about what we go through on a daily basis. Whether we're fighting for the regulatory advantages associated with taxation, whether it's certain industries that uh, that we have never given up the right to do, like gaming. Because I want to be clear. Gaming wasn't given to us by the states. It wasn't given to us by the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And it wasn't given to us by the Supreme Court. It was acknowledged by the Supreme Court that we had the right to do it, but it wasn't a right given to us. And then when they passed a law shortly after the Supreme Court made that ruling, they did everything they could to trim back and to, and, and to take some control over our what we do on our territories. So if anything, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was an infringement. And of course, the reason it they were able to pull it off is it wasn't so much that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act made it gaming easier for us. It made it easier for vendors. It made it easier for people who would lend money. And that, in the end, would make gaming easier for us, but at a cost. But when you look at all of the things that, that Native people have introduced in, uh, conceptually and ideologically to, to, to the United States, look, when the colonists decided they were going to declare their independence from, uh, from the UK, they had to build a case. And, and part of what, you know, when they did their Declaration of Independence, is let, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. That's the way Jefferson wrote it. Of course, he called us a merciless Indian savages in that document. But beyond that, many of the things that he charged uh, the King of England with as far as these crimes or these, uh, you know, these uh, aggressive acts were things that, that we had already raised about them. And, and in fact, what the colonists would try to uh, incorporate in a, in a new style of governance would be something that they would, would grab certain pieces from, uh, from the Haudenosaunee, from native peoples to say, Look, this is something that is unique to this land. Part of the argument in, in declaring independence from Europe was to say this was a distinct piece of land. And with this piece of land came distinct ways of operating on that land. So they, they could use our land and our concepts as something that was, that were, was distinct to the land and then use that as an argument uh, uh, against you know, European powers, but uh, Great Britain in particular, to say – we are different than, than Europe. And, and when they say we, they meant we as in white men. And then they tried to assert that they were not British subjects, that they were Americans, that they, that they had grown with this land, this new way of, uh, of not only governance, but this idea that there are inalienable rights, not just rights given to you by the government, that there are rights that are, um, are birth rights that come from the mere act of being created, of being born. So this was not a widely held uh, view in, in Europe. Many of the things that they, uh, th that they incorporated in their, both in their Declaration of Independence and their Constitution were ideas that were unique to this land and to the people who live here predating their arrival. And yet, again, I go back to the same thing. Almost from day one, we end up in, uh, in, this, in this battle, not only for, for survival. I mean, when we talk about 
the American genocide. What we're really talking about is the, the five policies they talk about, extermination, removal, assimilation, termination, uh, self-determination, all of these, these ways of just trying to eliminate us as, as people. So, and the, the most underlying part of all this, uh, the, these policies of the United States was, was assimilation. And assimilation is this idea of creating the conditions where people would cease to exist as they had exist previously and that they would be, have somebody else's cultural or national character imposed upon them. And that's what, we, that's what we've, we are constantly experiencing. So when we get into a battle over things like jurisdiction, over over a land rights issue or a tax issue or you know again any any kind of jurisdictional battle these are ideological battles based on a, a people who held those distinctions long before white people ever showed up here and yet these are still the battles that were that were you know that were waging this many years i got i got to be be real clear here genocide is United States and other European colonial powers clearly are and were guilty of genocide. That doesn't mean the genocide was successful. I mean, and not, and not in totality, put it that way. We're still here. We're still here and we're still fighting for a distinction. We're still here fighting for our sovereignty. We're still trying to carve out and cling on to some elements that, that define us differently from, you know, from Americans from Europeans, from, uh, from people who still could never fully embrace some of the concepts and some, you know, some of the, uh, the freedoms, as Jack Weatherford refers to. Look, the Europeans could not believe that people could live with, with freedom in the absence of, of, of a king, in the absence of that kind of you know, crown rule. So this is kind of, a, it, it, is, it is unique uh, and you know, and I heard other you know, anthropologists talk about, well, this must be what um, w what must have existed at the dawns of uh, of, of society, uh, the dawning of a civilization, and and by saying so, made it sound like our systems were crude because they because they lacked the institutional framework that had that has, had become such a part of European culture. But that's not what. What, what would lie at the, at the foundation of the way that we chose our lifestyles to be was making sure that we were not pushing against the natural order of things. And I don't, you know, look, this isn't about, you know, uh, turning nature into a God, but this is about acknowledging that we all have a place in, the, in this, um, it, it, within the powers of nature. And so when we talked about creating um, uh, conflict resolution or, or, or governance or, or any kind of um, ways of uh, attaining consensus uh, for a community, we did it in a way that was the most natural. And we utilized families. We utilized our, um, you know, our, our commitments to not only the people that we could see that we lived with, but future generations. Now, that may seem a little unnatural. There's not a whole lot of living species that, that, that think that far ahead. But that's what one of the, the unique things about man is that we, we have the ability to think that far ahead and not just live for the moment. Most, most living creatures have it kind of built into their systems not, to not deplete resources and not you know wipe something out to the point i mean granted even a locust that would wipe out all vegetation knows that they they they're going to do that and then they're going to be dormant for uh you know for, for a decade or so so they know that the cycle will come back look even fire you know fire which you know as i talked about earlier which could be so destructive also has a way of spawning rebirth not only um, look, there's there are even certain um, types of vegetation that won't even release their seeds seeds in their, or their spores until um, until a fire uh, comes through. I mean, fire is actually such a natural part of um, uh, you know of again re rejuvenating the land that it's unnatural to to fight it in the way that it's been fought. 
So part of what we always try to understand is that, is that there is a way to live with nature and not to always pit yourself against it. And that's the biggest difference we see when people talk about you know, civilization. Civilization is man's personal battle against the natural order of things, trying to create a, a human-centric world where everything, all of creation is, uh, is viewed as something that was put there for their use. use. In fact, m much religious dogma suggests that. Much, reli much religious dogma um, suggests that um, their, you know, Genesis, you know, talks about all of these things being, uh, being created um, for, for man. And that it is man's job to put all of those things, um, uh, to, to have control over all of those things. This is kind of what lies at, uh, at the foundation of so much of, um, uh, of, of man's way of thinking about things. So as we, as we still try to carve out our autonomy and distinction, look, we have our own battles. Because, because of that power of uh, genocide and, and of um, assimilation, we, we too, as Native people, we are, we are struggling. We are struggling amongst ourselves trying to maintain identity and distinction. Look, we've had to fight like hell to get our language back. We've had to do so many things different because, um, be, because of the pressures uh, put on by a dominant culture all around us. And... Many of us have, you know, whether it's because of church, whether it's because of, you know, poverty, whether it's because of, uh, you know, lifestyle choices, whether it's enlistment in the military or, or having to leave your territories to find an, uh, an employment, whatever the case may be, we have struggled to maintain our own distinction. And to the extent that our territories do carve some of these things out, and, and try to figure out, well, how can we use our distinction to our advantage economically, socially? We are oftentimes, again, met with such conflict from, from the states. It, it actually, at the, at the uh, federal level, the, what they consider the, the current policy of the United States, which is to encourage uh, self-determination, to the extent that the United States embraces that concept, it's... It, they ignore the, the uh, international definition of self-determination and say, no, we only mean they can organize themselves within uh, their own social structures. They don't recognize our governing authority to have any sovereign control over our lands. That's the United States policy. So even when we hear presidents or elected officials talk about uh, native sovereignty. I remember one of the classics is is George W. Bush being asked about, well, what is native? Uh, what do you consider, or, or what's your views on tribal sovereignty? I mean, he fumbled for a, a, a clear five minutes, just saying, yeah, it's because they're sovereign, and uh, you know, tribal sovereignty. It is what it, I mean. He just, just, I mean, he couldn't even begin to express it. And part of the reason is. There's such a, a caution on, on, the, on the part of elected officials to acknowledge that, yes, we do have a, a distinct rights that we've never sacrificed. We've never given up. And, and the point that I always try to make in, with these conversations is not only have we never given them up, but the United States doesn't even have any clear, you know, law or... Um, or agreement, a treaty, or otherwise, there's no event in American history that says that our lands were were surrendered to the United States. It's funny during the um, Iraq War, there was all this conversation about when the United States would would return sovereignty to the uh, to Iraqi control. They they said, when will the, there be the transfer of sovereignty back to Iraqis? And you know, as that conversation was, was all over the news cycle. Obviously, what came to mind as a Native person is, yeah, when did we ever transfer our sovereignty to you? When, you know, so there wasn't an, an invasion necessarily. I mean, everybody throughout history is oftentimes taught that Native people were conquered. Well, that's simply not the, not the case. If you look at uh, historically, there's only been tops 50 definable um, military uh 
uh, engagements between native peoples and and the United States. And and 50 is is uh, is probably a high estimate. The United States didn't win all of those. But even if you consider even if you consider those things in the overall scheme of things there there's there was close to you know 500 to maybe even 1000 distinct native peoples. So to suggest that uh, 50 armed conflicts turned into a uh, conquest of all of our people it's a, it's an absurd proposition and it simply didn't happen many of those conflicts never resulted in a in a clear surrender agreement or a capitulation to the point where we said okay to to your to you the victors you get all of our spoils no that's not the way it, it, it's ever worked out so some of these things are complete mischaracterizations of the truth and while on one hand the the, the broad American public w can has certain um, assumptions they make, there, if you were to, were to ask the average person, uh, average American, they would acknowledge that we are distinct people. I mean, most non-native people believe that we have our own laws, we have our own customs, we have our own rights to rule over our territories even as their governments do everything they can to undermine it. So there's a sense that the broad American public is probably farther along in understanding that relationship than, than policymakers, than lawmakers, than elected officials. And that's why we find ourselves still in the, in the midst of, uh, of, of the very battles that I've, that I've talked about. Look, we have had literally millions of dollars seized from native businesses simply because the United States would imply that, uh, that they, they are ill-gotten gains, whether it was from tobacco, whether it's from gaming. The, uh, fairly recently, uh, or I say recently, this was during the Obama administration, there was an attempt to um, expand health coverage for children. So in order to... Um, uh, pay for that because the Republicans said, look, we're not going to allow any expansion of governmental services without a clear means to pay for, uh, pay for those social services. So the federal government increased the excise tax on tobacco products at the federal level. It went from like $3.40 up to, up to like $10. Um, so uh, for a carton, that is. And so it was a significant increase. And at the very end of that provision, <clears throat> what they said was, any products that were cleared at the old rate but had not entered the commerce stream yet, cleared at the old tax rate, that means, and but had not entered the commerce stream, uh, had to have taxes assessed as they sat on the floor. They called it the floor tax. Now, there was no place in this law that suggested that was to be, uh, to be enforced against Native people. We took that, pro uh, to the extent that we bought non-Native products, we took that out of their commerce stream and put it into ours. And... So this idea that a floor tax would be assessed against products sitting in a native smoke shop or in the back room, in the, in the storeroom of a native smoke shop was something not even considered. And yet the, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, the, uh, the tax department, charge department, I should say, went about sending letters out to you know, hundreds, if not thousands of native people saying, uh, we determined that you owe us 50, 100, 200, $300,000. I mean, it's, it was an absurd... Um, uh, abuse of, of their authority. And when confronted with it and asking lawmakers says, no, we never considered the floor tax to be intended to be used against native people, but there we have it. The federal government went ahead and, and tried to impose this, uh, on our people. Anyway, we pushed back and, and there hasn't been a whole lot of pushback since then, but it's just an example of how often what we do on our territory is not recognized as something distinct. Look, we're going to go to a break here. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about, as I mentioned earlier, there have been studies that talk about how much benefit there's been to a state or a region based on the economies of, uh, that, that develop on Native territory. So we'll talk about that when we come back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. We'll be right back.
All right. Thanks for coming back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Hey, I want to give a shout out to our listeners on WPFW in Washington, D.C. Um, it's, it's great to have you along for the ride. I do want to remind people that our show is a podcast, and you can uh, you can search on Google or uh, or on Alexa or your smart speaker. Uh, you can ask for Let's Talk Native with John Kane podcast. You, and I, again, I want to encourage people to go to our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. We've got a lot of good videos. And uh, look, some of the ones that have gotten a lot of play recently have been the ones on Ruth Bader Ginsburg or perhaps on Columbus. Uh, you know, th there's, there's a number that we've done on short form videos. And of course, all of these shows get put up, as, uh, posted as a video as well. So, um, you know, check us out. If you're, if you're not subscribed to our podcast, order a YouTube channel, you might be missing some content. So uh, by all means, uh, check us out. All right, I talked about the, uh, the fact that there have been economists have looked at uh, the, how much native economies have contributed to the area. Look, when we talk about gaming, for instance, in, uh, in here in Western New York, the Seneca Nation is like the fifth largest employer in uh, in Western New York, uh, you know, so when you when you think about how many people are employed, and I'm not just talking about Native people here. In in, in most gaming operations, ninety percent of the employment is non-Native, and they all pay taxes. Even if we don't, <laughs> they all pay taxes. The other thing about the the revenue that is generated from Native territories is that. We aren't multinational corporations. We aren't. We don't have shareholders in you know in, in in other states. We live here. Many of our territories don't have some of the the basic um, uh, service and product uh, sales available on our territory. So we buy and shop you know off of our territories. So all of the money that is generated, whether it's from tobacco sales, fuel sales, gaming, uh, any other products or services, manufacturing that we do on our territories, all of that, almost all of that money gets spent right back into the local economy. You know, when they do an, an analysis, they talk about how much um, uh, economic activity has been stimulated, you know, uh, uh, how much, how many dollars worth of economic activity have been generated from, from an industry. It's not just how much money we, uh, we pull in from, a ver from various industries. It's how much we put back into the economy through, through our vendors and through, uh, frankly, even when somebody saves money, if you save, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 20 bucks on, uh, on a cart of cigarettes, <laughs> literally, yes, uh, or on a fill-up of gas, gasoline, that means you, the consumer, have more money to spend in the area. So even when the state says, well, we, we're missing out on tax revenue, yeah, you might be, but you're getting it back anyway because we're going to spend that, uh, spend the the profit that we make off of that stuff and the, uh, the cost savings are going to be spent back in the local economy. There aren't a whole lot of people who are banking um, a dollar saved uh, on a gallon of gas or, 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 you know, or, or, or a tank full of gas or whatever else. So when, when these things have been studied, they, they see that there's almost a disproportionate benefit. In fact, arguably, the non-native region, the, the regions around our territory benefit more. There's, a, there's an old school that says that in order for a community, an old school thought, I, that, I guess that is, that in order for to benefit from economic, act, economic activity in a, in a region or in a, a state or, or whatever, in a country, the dollar has to change hands within the, the study area, you know, four, five, six, eight times. That doesn't happen. Most of the dollars that come into native territories go out almost immediately. Look, we, we may fill up our gas tanks too here. But for the most part, money that comes into our territory may change hands two or three times. But look, we're at line in Walmart. We're buying our cars out there. We're paying for our, our cell bills out there. All of this, most of the products and services we consume on territory are from off territory. That, th those dollars don't change hands a bunch of times. They stay in the area. So even if a dollar comes out of Erie County, let's say, into uh, the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation, it comes right back. It's not a black hole. You know where money does disappear? <laughs> the money that goes to Albany, that goes to the state capitals. And, th and this is true for almost any, uh, any state. Look, 
gaming, for instance, in uh, in the battle that the Senecas are having with New York State over gaming revenue, in the first 14 years of their gaming compact, uh, the the state of New York took in one and a half billion dollars from revenue sharing. Only about 400,000, or I'm sorry, 400 million of that came back to Western New York. The rest of it went into state coffers. And it's funny because, you know, in, in New York, there was a, a lot of, you know, n noise made over you know, Cuomo pitching this thing called the Buffalo Billion, where a billion dollars of economic activity was going to come into Buffalo. The state was going to revitalize the economy in Western New York. The reality is they took a billion dollars out. That Buffalo Billion never even came back to Western New York, and it sure as hell didn't come to Native people. So when you look at the economic activity, where it's the most detrimental to a region is when it's either pulled into the feds or it's pulled into the state capitals away from the local regions that really need that economic activity. But again, when these studies have been done, and they've looked at you know, the scale of the employment that, uh, that uh, Native territories represent. And most of the studies that are done oftentimes only look at the Seneca Nation, for instance, or they'll look at, it, at, the, at the nation enterprises. They don't, don't look at the private sector. In, in Seneca territory, for instance, and in many other Native territories, there have been uh, the development uh, of uh, a vibrant private sector. Those, uh, those numbers oftentimes are included in these studies because these studies are usually kind of self-serving for, for a nation to, um, to you know, pitch its benefit to an area, but it doesn't necessarily always include the private sector. The private sector in native territories oftentimes have advanced the, uh, laid the groundwork, I should say, for the overall economy of a native territory. So whether it's pushing back on, you know, state regs as it relates to taxation, you know, for us to advance things like gas or, um, or, or tobacco sales, or even the gaming, uh, a lot of the gaming was done, you know, smoke shops used to, you know, frankly, they threw machines in, they had poll tabs, they had all, any number of um, various ways of doing gaming on native territories. And that advanced the gaming market also. So when a lot of these territories went from high stakes bingo to, uh, to class two gaming and ultimately to class three gaming, that market didn't just, you know, get created out of thin air. A lot of times these, these were built up by the private sector native territories. And, and I'll tell you, one of the other places that gaming has existed for a long time has been these organizations, whether it's the Legion or the church or, you know, some, you know, one of these fraternal orders or whatever. Uh, they, they were always operating gaming. And, you know, so these markets are oftentimes developed not by the states and, and, and yet they end up ultimately becoming somewhat of the beneficiary as, as not only the, the states get into the, the high stakes gaming industry, but as they fleece whatever they can from, uh, from what's happening, you know, on native territories or, or, or at any other level of gaming. So I think it's really important that people understand the other, that, that the self-sufficiency that we develop on our own, in spite of fighting the states off, they're, it, it's a win-win situation. The more self-sufficient we are, the better it is for the state, certainly the better it is for the federal government, and of course, the better it is for us. So the idea of becoming self-sufficient and, and creating some of these industries, albeit industries that do depend on non-native um, uh, patronage, that doesn't mean that we're taking anything away from the states. And any of the arguments that were ever made about the detrimental effects of, uh, of our tax-free sales, for instance, there's never been any real analysis that can actually put together um, a negative impact study on the sales of, that happen on our, on our territories. In fact, the crazy part is there was a study by the Tax Foundation and another organization they worked with that determined that somewhere just under 60%, but over 50%, it was like 56 or you know, 58% of all tobacco products sold in New York State were, uh, were, were considered contraband sales. They were considered um, uh, uh, sales that did not pay New York State tax on them. And they weren't even talking about native sales. They were talking about people who leave the state to buy their products elsewhere. Now, that's revenue that the state loses. 
And they lose it not only in terms of the, the tax revenue, but they also lose it in terms of the economic activity because the sales are taking place in another state. The other place they lose, uh, they lose dollars is, is what they call the Master Settlement Act fun- monies that they get. Other states are, are, are gaining the, the, um, the Master Settlement Act funds from their sales. They're not tracking those, those sales come back to New York. I remember going down Interstate 81 in uh, uh, down below Syracuse, right into Pennsylvania. As soon as you cross that Pennsylvania line, there's there were like six or seven uh, shops right there. Uh, it's called I think it was called Halstead or Hems- Halstead, Pennsylvania. I think it was, and they're all right there, right at the state line. Now they aren't there at the state line to sell to Pennsylvanians. They're there to to catch New Yorkers because they it was cheaper to buy you know buy cigarettes in Pennsylvania than New York State. Those kinds of sales, they take from a region. Our sales on our territories, they they kept money in this region. Now, look, when we were doing mail order tobacco and that kind of thing, yes, there were other states who were probably losing some revenue to New York State. But you know who fought us most over this? Not those other states, New York State themselves. They shot themselves in the foot. And in fact, when I was talking to um, uh, state or a congressman and, and, and the, uh, um, Higgins office, Congre- Brian Higgins office and uh, um, oh, what's her name? The uh, Kirsten Gillibrand's office, the, the state, the, the U S Senator from New York about the floor tax that I mentioned earlier. I said, you don't want to make the same mistake you made when you, when you put a prohibition on, uh, on non-direct sales or, you know, direct to consumer sales or, uh, through mail order. You guys never did any of the analysis on how many jobs you were killing in Western New York. And now you're going to make the mistake again. And I got both those, both the, the, the congressman and the senator to admit that they, they never studied the, uh, um, studied the issue properly when they were shutting down what was considered mail order tobacco. And that was all the more reason that they said, look, we had no legislative intent with the floor tax to have a, um, this, this excise tax imposed on product that was sitting on native territories. That was a big, big admission to get from these guys. And part of the reason that the feds really stopped pushing back on trying to collect that tax. But, but again, this is, there is almost like a knee jerk reaction that if we do something that is profitable on our territories, the first thing the States try to do is shut us down. I mean, they don't even study the uh, study the issue. And, and when I say States, I don't just mean state legislators or the governor. In the case of uh, you know, congressmen and, and uh, senators from the state, they oftentimes will pitch that somehow what we're doing is a national security threat. Uh, look, in, in the world that we live in today, there is such an uh, emphasis on tracking every dollar. This idea that there would be a cashless society is so they would know not only how much you spend, but where you spend it, how you spend it. Every dollar can be tracked. There, part of the emphasis uh, on this cashless society is, uh, frankly, privacy issues. They would prefer that you didn't do much with cash. There are, there are times that you can't even spend cash in some places because they don't want the, the, the hassle of it all. But it's, it becomes, in, in many, for many territories that, that rely on cash-based businesses, and, and frankly, native territories are an example of that, banking um, products aren't, most financial products aren't as available to us on native territory as they are off territory. I mean, the idea that we were able to um, develop merchant accounts to, uh, to scan credit cards, that was problematic for many years. We knew that when we were putting, uh, having sales through, a, through, a cre- through credit card processing, that the, that the states who are still battling us over our tax-free sales would at some point perhaps seize those accounts. And in fact, there was, uh, there was a whole rash of, um, of businesses that did have their merchant accounts seized. So yeah, we relied a lot on cash-based businesses. And the uh, automatic assumption that, that some would make is that if we're a cash-based business, that we're somehow laundering money. This is, and again, this is part of the thing where, um, where racism becomes part of the, uh, the calculation on how much scrutiny our businesses get. But as I said in the beginning of the show, the question that you know that, that you got, I have to ask is, why, why do we still have to fight the states in, in such a way? Why don't we ever get to the place where 
we can sit down and talk about some of these issues. Not because we want to comply, but just so there's a better understanding. By the time I actually have a conversation with a Kirsten Gillibrand's office or a Brian Higgins office over things like floor tax and then look back at them shutting down mail order tobacco, that's when there's finally an acknowledgement. I mean, when, when somebody says, yeah, we probably could have done better. You, you could have done better if you had talked to us back then. You know, we, we listened to, you know, to various presidents, including Barack Obama, who used to say that um, he wanted to have, you know, full engagement with Native people. He insisted through executive order that any um, uh, policy or, 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 uh, or act by a, an executive branch, department, agency, committee, whatever, um, that would have what he called tribal implications, he insisted required face-to-face -face conversation. He, he insisted that it needed to, to have consultation, not consensus, consultation with, with Native people. And yet, rarely did it ever happen. It's nice to put on an executive order, but you know, it's, it's like Trump's executive orders. These are things you do in front of a camera, you sign it, you hold it up, and then it gets tucked away and, and then means nothing. And the same thing happened during the Obama administration. We didn't have consultation. And I'll tell you another thing. Under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it doesn't talk about free, prior, and informed consultation. It, it, it mentions free, prior, and informed consent. So when a state, when a, when a nation state adopts a policy that has negative impact, or even frankly, if it just may have impact on native territories, according to the international community, the, the minimum standard, the minimum standard for states in their relationships with indigenous peoples is supposed to require free prior and informed consent. In case you don't know what that means, it means that there should be a free flow of information that we should be furnished that information prior to any enactment and that we should consent to that enactment. Not just enough to say, well, you know, we, we talked to you for five minutes. We, uh, we gave you some consultation and then we went ahead and did it anyway. That's what we experienced. So, I, you know, I, I once asked, you know, you know the policies of, um, of, the states and the federal government and, and Canada and the provincial governments, it comes down to a choice. Either you recognize our sovereignty, our distinction, our autonomy, or you can cont you continue down the path of genocide. And that's what it is. The more you try to impose your will, your national character, your laws, your so-called rule of law against our people without ever having established the right to do so, that is, by definition, genocide. Because when genocide talk, the, the definitions of genocide that include creating the conditions that show the intent, the, the willful intent to make a people cease to exist in the future. That's, I mean, that's what assimilation is. When you impose your national character on somebody and strip away theirs, whether whether you do it through laws, whether you do it through residential schools, whether you do it through moving people out of, off of their homelands or, or exterminating them. That's all genocide. It, by, it, by doing sterilization programs, yeah, these are all things that happen to Native people. But what still happens today, and the fact that it may seem less egregious than sterilization, murder, you know, um, starving to death or whatever else, but the fact that assimilation seems almost benign doesn't mean that it's not genocide. And I'll tell you, it's not benign. It is an aggressive act because it is a, it is a theft of identity. It is, it is an attempt to make us cease to exist as the people that we still struggle today uh, to, to maintain ourselves. And, and you know, the thing is, we aren't fighting back violently. We are mostly just trying to carve out our existence inch by inch and maybe grab something back, some control over our lives. That's what, that, you know, that's what we're doing. I mean, hell, even when we, we develop gaming, we, we spend a billion dollars building a facility and all those contractors are non-native. The people who lent, you know, the, the, the financing comes from non-native sources. There's more money made by the outside than, than our people. Even today, when New York State says, we're going to impose revenue sharing on you, we're going to make you pay revenue sharing, they're pulling in $200 million a year 
that's that's larger than the cut that the Seneca people themselves get. But again, it's never enough. Because here's the thing. Even, even when we talk about, you know, a billion dollars over, you know, over 10 years or over seven years or, or whatever. For New York State, that's not a lot of money. For us, for a native territory, a couple hundred million dollars a year, that's a lot of freaking money. I mean, and the, the crazy part is there have been land claims that have been settled for less than that. Up in Aquasasne, I think they were offering like uh, $250 million for, for a, a land claim settlement. The Senecas pay that almost in a year for revenue sharing to New York State. And it was nothing, it's nothing for state to, uh, you know, to, to pay out a couple hundred million dollars. Hell, they pay a, I think it's a billion dollars a week they pay in Medicare. A billion dollars a week. So when we talk about uh, giving up $200 million a year to the state of New York in, in gaming revenue, revenue alone, and then to the extent that we're, uh, we're in a, you know, a battle constantly over, uh, over taxation, look, we still have our, our people being dragged into court. One of my sponsors here, Drag is dragged into court for, and what's he in court for? For for distributing a native brand of tobacco from a native territory, from for, originally from a native supplier to a native territory to another native territory. We're not even talking about sending something to you know to to a non-native retailer. This is just native to native business. But even that, we're in a constant battle with um, with this, not just New York State. We saw this play out in in Washington State with the, with the Yakima. There's always these, these states. We see it playing out in Oklahoma over gaming, in New Mexico over gaming. There's always this effort by states to do whatever they can to limit our, um, our success. And in the few places that we've been able to carve out any success. And like I said, the more self-sufficient we are, the better it is for everybody. Because when you create economic disparity and you have the haves and the have-nots, that's when the tensions exist. You know, there, there's a, a solid argument that says that racism isn't as big, a, big an issue in the United States as classism. The, the, the problem is that much of the economic class runs right along racial lines or, or the perceived racial lines. But from, from a Native standpoint, if we did better, so would the people around us do better. And that's always been the case. Look, even, even from, the, from the very beginning, you know, there were, historically... Even somewhat referencing even what Jack Weatherford was talking about, there was an effort by the, the more puritanistic communities of New England not to allow their people to see the freedoms that Native people had because they thought it would corrupt their people. They thought that if the freedoms that Native people enjoyed in their way of life were, were ever to... Uh, influence their people. They not only would they would they lose their control over women, but they would have lost their control over the imposed hierarchy of power that has always been a part of the uh, of the United States. So that's what I wanted to talk about today on my show. I wanted to ask that question. You know why? Why are we still in this battle? And why does the United States, Canada, the states, the provinces, why do they view Native people as such a threat? You need to ask yourself that. And maybe as you ask yourself that, you'll realize that there aren't good answers. And one of the things that, you know, that I will say is we have gen generally have had pretty good support from the non-governmental, uh, you know, non-natives of, of, of a region. We usually, um, you know, it's not just, a, you know, the, the activist allies. We usually have pretty good support. Most people can recognize that, that we have, you know, certain rights that perhaps they don't. The question ends up being, do they resent the fact that they, because somehow they believe we've been given these rights, or do they acknowledge that we never gave those rights up in the first place? And when they come to that secondary conclusion, then they got to ask themselves, why are we giving up so much of ours to the federal government, to the state government? And I think that's a question for everybody. Hey, look, I want, you to, I want to thank you guys for listening to Let's Talk Native. Um, Again, check out our podcast, check out our YouTube uh, channel, Let's Talk Native TV. And uh, hey, we'll see you next time right here on Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.